This is a picture of Kronos, the god of time, eating his children. It was painted by Francisco Goya on the walls of his house as life came to an end and time ran out. This is how I feel about the problem I work on. My name is Kirsten. I'm a mother, I'm a cultural historian, I'm an entrepreneur, an innovation practitioner, and the CEO of an organization called Climate Kick, which is funded by the European Union's Institute of Innovation Technology here in Budapest, and a number of other funders. I work on innovation. I have done so for a number of years in the public impact context and in the corporate world. So one of my constant explorations is, what is innovation? What is it useful for? And when your job is reverse climate change and build human resiliency, that inquiry becomes even more important and urgent because we are out of time and our present choices are eating away the future. So I'm here to share with you what I have learned about the practice of innovation as if the future mattered. How to take innovation beyond growth. Let's start with the problem. Climate change is systemic. It's about changes happening in the whole life support system of this planet that are affecting all of its parts and that will affect our lives in all their aspects. The natural systems that are responding to rising temperature and environmental degradation are complex, adaptive systems, which means they behave in nonlinear ways. So the consequences of change don't go in straight lines and they don't stop and wait for us to work out how to fix them. And the consequences of that for us, for human experience, is extreme uncertainty. If the implications of that haven't sunk in yet, we have a global pandemic giving us a glimpse of what that might mean. Who knew that a virus crossing one species in one town, in one country, in one place on Earth would lead to a major aggression in gender equality for women? Or the cost of container freight shipping going up by more than 400%? or an unprecedented development in collaboration between competitors in the global pharmaceutical industry and a demonstration in just a few months of what it might mean to reduce global emissions by 7% in one year, something that we would need to do every year, year on year, for the next 10 at least, to get to where we need to be to stay within livable global warming. So climate change is systemic, it's complex, and for us, it causes radical uncertainty. To be effective, our responses to it need to be systemic, at scale, and fit for purpose. In other words, our ways of dealing with climate change need to deal with the whole and the parts, and they need to have the properties and capabilities of complex adaptive systems. They need to have those properties embedded within them. Above all, our actions need to be directed at us, at human systems, at our mental model for the way in which we think about relating to each other and to our environment. Ultimately, at our design for life. Addressing climate change is fundamentally about social transformation. And that is the principal source of the complexity we face. It's not just our carbon footprint we need to deal with, it's our human handprint. Our design for life is a root cause issue. It's our economic thinking, our belief in our right to exploit the world around us, our focus on the short term. And at the same time, it is the best possible place to start from to catalyze self-transformation, to build hope and a sense of possibility. And that's why we really need innovation, but not as we have been doing it. Two critical questions. What are we using innovation for? And how are we designing it to achieve that? Now, I live and work in a world that constantly asks me to apply a competitive logic to innovation, to welcome a bunch of ideas, but then come up with criteria for selecting the best ones. That means funneling in to try and understand what should I really be placing my resources into. Often the best means the most profitable or the most appealing to market because that is the major assumption of how change happens in the world, or the most impactful in terms of carbon emissions, which incidentally are calculated ex ante or in the abstract because we haven't tried this stuff yet. But most limiting of all, I am asked to come up with 
a choice that of proposals that are most aligned or best aligned with the expectations of different funding sources, project finance or investment or funding needs. And that means that I end up needing to choose projects, usually, that have clear and demonstrable deliverables, that can show visible outcomes and quick wins in the short term, or are bankable assets, and even more ideally, might have a neat profit to show as the overarching indicator of success in a world in which change is all about market-induced financial flows. But when we are asking for that, we are asking innovation to iterate on the current system, on our existing ideas, our current ideas about prosperity, about success, about effectiveness, and about growth. And we know that system is broken. What else can we use for success criteria than what good looks like in the world that we know now? But well, we are supposed to be coming up with a world that we don't know now, that is beyond our experience, and beyond our current success criteria. So let me bring you back to this image. What force is powerful enough to counteract the inexorability of time consuming its children, of a sick planet spreading sickness and the consumption of life? Market forces are not the answer. In the complex, adaptive system that is life on Earth, and human experience, it is learning. Learning has an exponential dynamic. There are power laws in the way in which learning evolves, something that we forget, or perhaps we just underestimate it constantly. We are wired to survive by learning, having experiences, reflecting on them, making mistakes, encountering difference, addressing impacts and adapting, we do it faster than we realize. We do it en masse as well as individually. We transact in it, we trade in it, we see one another in it, we build the future through it. Human ingenuity and its expression in innovation is the most powerful tool we have to learn and to achieve through learning the mindset shifts and the cultural shifts we need to create a different design for life for 10 billion people on this planet to live sustainably. As a verb, innovation, to innovate, is transitive. It's not about coming up with something new for the sake of it. It describes making something that creates the possibility of acquiring new capabilities, new properties, of becoming different. To innovate is to make a change, a difference. A difference in a business model, in a value system, or in ourselves. It's like taking ourselves back to childhood, where we still believe in the possibility of making a difference. That's where we can wrest abundance from the jaws of scarcity. That's where we can find the energy, the creative space-making and shape-shifting of invention to see beyond what we know and to think outside the matrix. And right now, we need innovation to accelerate, to create an, like a Cambrian explosion of learning into why, what, and how to become different. And that needs to be done and led by human systems. So here's what I have learned about how to do that. These are principles, insights, practices that I am applying in the work I do, that we are seeking to bring to life in the practices of Climate Kick or in Cora Foundation or a number of other organizations that are thinking in similar ways. These are principles for harnessing the power of innovation to catalyze self-reflective and systemic change in human systems. First principle. Don't run straight to solutions, which we find so hard. We tend to do all the time. As soon as we find a problem, we put our finger on something, we start solving for it immediately, which means that we keep getting trapped in incremental respo responses because we ex find what we expect to find. To learn to become different, we need to make space for exploration, for experimentation, and for the discovery of relevance for our needs and the contexts we're in. And for this, I'm going to use the concept of intent rather than objective. It signifies taking the time to understand, to see the system and to think systemically. Look for interdependencies, barriers for change, attractors, but above all, to create a shared framework around what is needed and where to use innovation to explore. In part, that's about agreeing the intention to transform and committing to it. 
working out who needs to be there, be part of that, and bringing them into the process, because we know we can't find solutions on our own, and we cannot and we must bring everybody with us. And in part, it's also about embracing the fact that we don't know where self-transformation will bring us, but we commit to learning by doing. Here is an example of this principle. Helping a remarkable regional government understand where and how to use innovation to connect climate action to social cohesion. Working with intent means designing for unintended consequences and for unpredictable outcomes, building projects with stakeholders in such a way that the construction of the project itself builds a shared intent strong enough to hold space for transformation. So it might seem counterintuitive given the urgency of climate change, but the first principle of harnessing innovation for transformation is to make haste slowly and deliberately, what the Romans called festina lente. The second practice is to build up the adaptive capability of a system, like a city or a farming community or a business, by creating options, by supplying it with what Gregory Bateson called a budget of flexibility, or what I am calling here or naming here as a budget of possibility. This is really about taking an approach to innovation that is fit for purpose, i.e. understanding and embracing complexity not as a bug but as a feature and designing innovation to fit that. Think about it. Large-scale transformation in multiple places across value chains, industries, cities, societies all over the world simultaneously and in 10 years. It's impossibly complex and uncertain. So concentrating on individual initiatives and asking them to compete against each other doesn't make very much sense. Better to acknowledge that what we are up against and what we're trying to achieve is beyond our problem-solving experience and design for a spread of possibilities in each place using a portfolio, a systems innovation portfolio. What does that mean? Well, it starts with specific places and real-world challenges. It anticipates looking for solutions and innovation actions that can engage sensitive intervention points in a city or a land use system or a business, like acupuncture points that could catalyze shifts, including social change. It seeks a range of innovations to engage with multiple levers for change simultaneously, using the whole toolbox, including regulation and finance, for example. And then we search out and engage with a whole bunch of diverse innovation initiatives that are relevant to and meaningful for the context we're working with and select a combination of them to fund or to invest where the, com the selection is as much about the relationships among them as it is about the individual projects. This is a substantive difference with respect to the, cl the, the classical practice of competitive call proponent project. I'm going to refer to it as layering, a structurally different approach to the funneling of innovation looking for excellence and market fit. All the innovations in these portfolios are imperfect pieces of a puzzle, acting together, learning from one another, responding to context, and forming new dynamics. It's a genuinely pragmatic approach that leverages our experience and our intelligence about contextual dynamics and constantly adapts objectives, plans, and outcomes as we learn and as we keep coming back to the intent to transform. From a financing and investment perspective, it means breaking away from our habit of looking for single bankable assets and instead investing in innovations across value chains and supply chains in the portfolios themselves and their capacity to induce and to accelerate learning rather than assuming too much of any one of the individual parts. And above all, it means thinking of innovation not as a hero's journey but as a collective learning journey. Third practice is to realize the rich, actionable value that innovation provides us and use it to enable transformation. Converting innovation experience into insights and strategic arguments to support decision-making and action and scaling. What I'm referring to here is developing a progressive, iterative practice and activity of sense-making, active learning 
reading across the innovations in a portfolio, connecting them to one another, extracting insights, reforming, redesigning, renewing them, both at the level of the portfolio and at the level of the individual actions, so that we get regulatory change and cross-pollination and synergies and combinations, the kind of stuff we need for exponential change. This is important for two reasons. Systems respond to attractors. And when social transformation is what is needed, attractors come in the form of acts of imagination. Humans need images, representations, and narratives to mobilize actions. This is one of the most important painted in the last major global pandemic. We can use a learning approach to innovation to help us understand and identify the attractors that mobilize the changes we need in our hearts as well as our minds, and use those insights to support social conversations over time, building narratives strong enough to hold communities through turbulence, through doubt, and through transition. We need that now. In climate action, we need it urgently. Secondly, innovation options provide choice. And Confidence. They build confidence for decision makers. Portfolio learning means that we can build strategic arguments for change, the narratives that decision makers need to act and to commit resources. Systems transformation as a pitch is pretty difficult to commit to. It's hard to adopt. But the layering of experience and evidence from the spread of innovations that are being tested and reshaped and tried on the ground in the context that matter, that builds the confidence to engage. More than seeking to engage capital, this is what we should have as a primary focus of innovation. Finally, we need the way we do innovation to enable change to happen, to make change happen. Where do the reframes that I've been talking about matter most? In what I call the messy middle, the yawning gap between our policy commitments to climate action even our own personal awareness of the need to do something, and the teeming world of individual solutions that are attracting capital already, the implementation gap. We have solutions. We have ideas. To some extent, we know how to use them. But our habits of thinking, our acting, decision-making, investing, do not lend themselves to joining the dots and connecting all of those solutions to each other, to the insights about policy and regulatory change and limitations and behaviors and cultures and practice, into deliberately designed new social structures and whole systems change. This is the work of what I call orchestration, the coordination of the parts to form a new whole, like the coordination of the nervous system does for our body. This is the work of active learning and the conversion of innovation, learning to policy and to investment. The messy middle is where we join our dots and change the rules and affect new systems design. That needs to be just as much the focus of innovation and investment as the, as the invention of new technologies and new ideas. In the messy middle is where we reinvent ourselves. In orchestration, However, we need to pay attention to three things. Transformative change depends upon capability and mindset. We need to be able to recognize that we need to change ourselves as we are changing the world and invest in the ability to do that. Systems innovation portfolios develop core competencies in the systems that use them, dynamic capabilities with which they can pursue strategic intents and goals. And that means they're building assets for societal resilience over the long term. Secondly, radical collaboration. At the moment, organizations like Climate Kick are operating alone or through limited consortia arrangements, each of us competing for funding. These conditions, that's a huge opportunity cost. We could be so much more powerful if we combined our efforts and brought together complementary research and innovation capabilities for a common purpose, like a kind of a mutualization approach, or if you like, a Gavi moment in climate action, similar to the vaccine coalition. And lastly, the transformational challenges that we have in front of us are in large part to do with use of and protection of the global commons, access to food, use, land use, air quality, energy, water, which means that we need an explicit recognition of the importance of designing for public value creation together with private value creation. It's not either or. 
And that means reaching into change at the heart of our accepted norms and notions of value, departing from core economics and cost-benefit thinking and rethinking rulemaking for justice, for long-term interests and for intergenerational responsibilities. Making ourselves different, coming up with new designs for human life, lies in our hands literally. We will learn no matter what, but we have a choice. We can learn through crisis as time runs out, or we can learn through insatiable curiosity, through deliberate design and deployment of innovation to unlock abundance, to create budgets of possibility, to give ourselves real choices and exercise the courage to transform profoundly. An orchestrated, coordinated transition of experiments and demonstrations of possibility. I want to leave you with the Cherokee parable that is about the power laws of human choice. There are two wolves in each of us, and they are always fighting. One is darkness and despair. One is hope and light. Which one wins? The one we feed. Thank you. <laughs>